All right, so titration. We're doing an experiment in lab about this, and essentially it means adding um, a known concentration of material to an unknown solution in a really controlled way. It's something that we call volumetric analysis. It means quantitative, very carefully quantitative, uh, using volumes, right? So we, we are going to use the initial and final volume of our burette readings. And remember, big idea here is that volumetric analysis, like burettes and pipettes and so forth, volumetric flasks, always has two decimal places. Um, so your burette reads four significant figures. That's a lot, right? And so this is a very, very precise method. Um, whether it's accurate or not is up for debate. So if you had done this titration in 141, um, you, you would see there's quite a lot of variability in the color of the indicator. Uh, it's really, really hard to get consistent pale pink colors. Um, so that indicates there may be a little bit of an accuracy issue there. That does not affect your precision. Your precision is still two decimal places, but it could affect your accuracy. And so one of the ways we can test that is by actually measuring the pH as we perform the titration. When you do that, if you know what the acid is, you can compare a theoretical Ka to the textbook. That's an accuracy assessment. You're using a reference value to see how close you are to correct. Not all titrations are acid-based neutralizations, but all the titrations we're going to do in this course are. You can actually use titration for all kinds of stuff, like telling how much iodide is in any aqueous solution or how much silver is in your mine water or whatever, right? There's tons of ways to use titration, but um, essentially it means very careful addition of a known concentration into an unknown and you can compute the concentration of the unknown based on the information. When you do a titration curve, oops, we have three different characteristics, um, sort of like positions in the curve that are important. So what you're going to see here um, is you always are going to plot the amount of base on the, on the x axis, usually as a volume. Well, not always the amount of base. This is actually the thing in the burette, the titrant. No. Okay. Um, and the pH is going to be on the on the y-axis here. So if you're titrating a weak acid with, say, NaOH, a strong base, you can use any strong base. NaOH is the cheapest, so that's technically typically what we use. Your pH is going to start out pretty low. We, you know, say two or so, just as an estimate. And of course, this is only going to go up to 14. But in this case, when you start out, you're going to take a pH before you even add anything in there. And then as you add base, it's going to slowly increase. So this is different readings until suddenly it just shoots way up and then it's going to flatten out again. So this is what it looks like. And sometimes um, people will just draw a line through all of these points to show the general shape. But this is what your data actually looks like while you're gathering it. You don't want to stop gathering a pH um, readings until you get a nice flat plateau at the top. All right. And so our equivalence point is the first important concept. And this is actually, we use this um, in Gen Chem 1, kind of, the equivalence point is halfway up the steepest part of the pH shift. So the way, the way to tell halfway up is we do this thing with rulers that's supposed to be on that line. Um, and you do a vertical line. And then you just measure the distance between these two things and divide it by two, right? So the computer doesn't do that for you. The lab quest will, but you know, like Excel doesn't do that. You have to do that on paper or using the drawing tools. If you need help with that, um, 
the instructions in the Excel lab number three from Gen Chem one have a pretty good description of how to, to draw lines on these graphs. I'm also happy to help you. Okay, so the equivalence point and what's happening there is the amount of weak acid that was there to begin with is equal to the amount of base you put in. That let's just pretend like that volume is 20 milliliters for this dilution or this titration rather. The midpoint is halfway along that process. All right, so our midpoint would be at 10 milliliters. So that'd be right here. Okay. Um, then finally, our end point is wherever the color change happens of our indicator. So phenolphthalein tends to change around nine. So our end point in this case is probably going to be a little bit higher than the equivalence point for this particular graph that I drew. You're going to mark that on there. So make sure to write it down when you go to lab. Now, the question is, what kinds of chemicals are present at each one of these points? So um, at the equivalence point, all of the, the weak acid you started with has reacted, which means it has formed its conjugate, which is also weak. So the pH will depend on the concentration of the conjugate. So you have to do an ice table to figure it out how much H plus there is, but you start it by knowing however much acid you began with is how much you have now. That's moles. Okay. So that's moles of acid converted into moles of conjugate. Then you have to divide by the current volume. Okay. So remember that in a titration, the volume changes. So what I mean by current is in this case, the amount of acid you put in there plus the 20 mils of base. So that's going to be your current volume. You want it to be in liters so you can get molarity and then solve your ice table. At the midpoint, what has happened is half of the acid has been converted. Well, has reacted. And it's going to form an equal amount of conjugate. So this would be a situation where the pH is not changing rapidly. In fact, um, we have a name for this area. We call this the buffer zone. That's what I call it anyway. I'm going to highlight the buffer zone in yellow over here. So this is the zone in which you can use, it's not very bright, in which you can use the henderson hasselbalch equation, where the pH is not changing rapidly. That's a buffer. So you can also make a buffer by having a weak acid and adding base to it to adjust the pH. You don't have to have the conjugate in there sort of like as a salt. You can just make it as you go. Um, so anywhere, whoops, that's hard to read. Anywhere in this area, you can use the henderson hasselbalch equation at the midpoint, though, it's going to simplify just like the first time we used it. It's going to simplify into the equation that the pH equals the pKa. And so this is how in lab you can use the graph to find the Ka, right? So we go from our midpoint all the way over and we read whatever that is. It looks like it's like maybe 3.5 in this case. So in our example, you can say it's 3.5 and then, of course, we can undo that to get the Ka, and then you can compare with the textbook. That's the beauty of a pH curve. You can check the accuracy of your titration. You can't do that with just the volume information. Okay, and so the end point is where the indicator is changing color, which may or may not match with the equivalence point. Usually it's not precisely the same thing. 